We are live on Facebook. Welcome to Global Perspectives on Race, Justice and Equity. I'm Abby Williams, Director of the Institute for Global Leadership and Professor of the Practice of International Politics at the Fletcher School at Law of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. The aim of Global Perspectives is to contribute to the long overdue national and global conversation on racial discrimination, which is deeply embedded in the political, economic, and social structures of many societies. These conversations will challenge everyone to take action to address the destructive legacy of systemic racism and to help promote a better and a more just and equitable world for all. Our guest today is General Nadia West. She is the 44th Army Surgeon General and the former commander of the Army Medical uh, Corps. She is the first African American Surgeon General, the first African American woman with a three star, was three star general, and the highest ranking woman graduate of West Point. So, Nadia, welcome to, to Global Perspectives. It's a pleasure to have you with us. And let me take you back to, to the beginning. Um, you were adopted into a, a large family of, of 11 other children. What sort of childhood did you have? Well, well thanks, Abby. It's, it's really great to join you today uh, to be able to talk about this really important topic. So thanks for the invitation. And uh, thanks for starting off with my, my childhood because, you know, again, that is what uh, led me to what, who I am today, is the basis and the foundation that I got. Um, and that was a gift because, as you mentioned, I was adopted. So uh, things could have gone much differently for me if it weren't for the, uh, you know, the big hearts of my parents uh, that were, that adopted me and, and my brothers and sisters. So growing up, it was, it was quite a, it was quite an interesting time. So I was the youngest of 12. And so of course the favorite, right, of all, you know, <laughs> the favorite of family. but, and all the, my brothers and sisters knew it as well. So uh, that, no problems there, no argument there, but, um, but the family was really a, a great, uh, I, I think a great laboratory in, you know, um, hard work, um, you know, values, deep faith, working together, resilience. I mean, all those things I, I think were, I didn't think of it at the time, of course, but looking back, you know, how my parents uh, raised us and the example they showed was really, uh, was really phenomenal. Um, and then my dad, who was in the military, uh, you know, growing up with that um, culture, because, you know, the discipline in the military, um, you know, he taught us the discipline as well, you know, being on time, doing all the things that you need to do, working hard and, um, you know, not, not complaining or whining when things get too tough. And so uh, those, are, those are some of the things that were in there from, you know, and then more for my mom as well. But I'll stop there. And as I mentioned to you before, Abby, you have to, you have to cut me off. I won't be embarrassed, <laughs> but I won't be upset or offended because once you get me started, I'll keep talking all day. So, so you have permission to say, okay, that's enough, let's move on. Okay, you, you mentioned, I'm sure, you mentioned, of course, uh, there that your, your dad had been in the military. Uh, did that have um, an impact on you going to West Point? And of course, you were the, I think, one of the first three classes, maybe the third class, which was uh, actually uh, of women who were admitted to West Point. Uh, did that have an impact on you going to West Point? And how did you feel when you uh, arrived at West Point? Well, absolutely, Abby, it did have a um, influence on me. My dad joined the Army in 1939. And so if you think back, um, the Army was still segregated at the time. Uh, the executive order uh, that was, um, that President Truman had uh, in enacted in 1948 was still quite a while in the coming. So he entered an Army where colored troops, as they were called, were trained separately from the, from the white troops. 
And Fort Huachuca, Arizona was where they sent all the color troops, but that's what they called them at the time, um, uh, to get training. And so, you know, he used to tell us stories of that all the time of how it started off where there was a perception that this was a punishment tour for the white soldiers that had to train them. And, uh, but as they started training them, teaching them how to march, teaching them how to fire their weapons, all the things, they started to see, okay, these are soldiers too. These are individuals. Some get it really quickly. Some can march really well. Some have two left feet. You know, they, they could see that this, these are people just like us and you could see them kind of, you know, not all of them, it wasn't, you know, all, you know, rosy, but most of them he saw their hearts changing because they had never, most of them had never had exposure to blacks in anything but a subservient role or, or what they heard. So his starting in the military and seeing that that could be a model for society, um, he stayed for 33 years. So clearly, clearly he, um, he, uh, he, he loved it. Um, despite all the warts, despite everything that you know he had to go through, and it wasn't easy. I mean, so he didn't paint it as a as a picture that it was easy, but he saw the promise in the organization, and so that's what kind of planted the seed. Just hearing these stories, um, my dad advanced. He he made it all the way up to first sergeant, um, uh, which in the enlisted ranks, and then he went to warrant officer school. So he had an opportunity to be a warrant officer and retired as a W four, which is really unheard of at that time in the in the seventies. So he actually was able to take advantage of some of the um, advancements based upon merit and you know what a what a what a novel concept um, during the time that he was in when it really wasn't that way in society so that had an impact on me um, my older brothers and sisters all joined as well some you know some, one was in the Navy one was in the women's army women's auxiliary Air Force so that's the WAFs and, and several of my sisters were wax the women's army corps and that's when they separated women women were in separate branch uh, than the men back in the 50s, 60s. Um, so fast forward to me in 1978, uh, when I started at West Point, and I had an older brother who went, uh, he graduated in 76. And so uh, when, uh, when I started, just think of how things had changed from 1939, a segregated army, 1960s and 70s, separate for women and men. 1978, the service academies were open for women. And so uh, that was kind of a, um, you know, just the, the, just the evolution of the military kind of leading society and, and, you know, equal work for equal pay, you know, opening jobs that were non-traditional for women and, and things of that nature. And uh, so I was, I was honored to be able to, to go there. So you asked the other part of your question was, what did you think when you first went there? It was, it was, a, it was a bit of a culture shock. I imagine. <laughs> I was going, I went to an all girls Catholic high school in, in Maryland, which was very small, you know, like 250 students in the entire school to a basically all male, you know, military academy with, with, you know, uh, 4,000 cadets total and about a thousand, a little over a thousand in my class, actually 1200 in my class started and 126 women were in that class. So we were not, we were not a whole lot of us back then. And so it was, it was a culture shock. Uh, it was, um, something I had never thought that, you know, I knew my brother went there, but it's different when you see someone else that's going there. And, and you know, I was in, you know, high school, you know, junior high and high, and so I didn't pay much attention to it. Uh, but when you sit there and you're there and you're learning and people are telling you, you know, back then they could yell at you, you know, and, you know, go here, go there. And it, I was thinking, whoa, what did I get myself into? <laughs> so, so it was a bit of a and culture shock. And, and, how, and how did you deal with this culture shock? Because you were both a woman and you're an African-American. How did you deal with the culture shock? And how did your peers at West Point and then the instructors at West Point um, uh, deal with this? Yeah, so uh, first of all, a, a lot of people were in shock. So as far as our classmates, um, I think most people were, were, were in the survival mode. So I think when you're in the survival mode, you can't look to the left and right and, and you know, uh, wonder whether or not somebody else should be there instead of you. You're trying to figure out how you're gonna stay. So your peers are were typically, uh, we're all in this together. And that's what they teach you. You know, we're all in this. I didn't really have any, um, you know, negative, you know, impact or negative feelings from my peers on the wholesale, are there one or two or three, of course, were there those that came from backgrounds where they just didn't know any better? Um, yes, and then you had to educate them. I, one of my friends who was, who's a black cadet, 
said the first, you know, when, the, when he first uh, got a roommate, and of course you don't pick your roommates, you're put in rooms. And so he was in the room already. And then when the white cadet came in, he looked and you could see his face fall like, uh, and he finally told him that he used to hide his wallet. Um, and and there, you only have so many places in the room. You got two beds, a desk, and so. But the white roommate said, "I used to told us because they became friends." He said, "I got to admit to you, at first when I, when I found you were my roommate, I would hide my wallet because, we're, you know, where I come from, we were told, yeah, you got steal, you're this, you're that, and the other." So I think there was a lot of ignorance, um, and of course about the hair. My hair used to be real, you know, real curly, and back then they made us cut our hair. We couldn't wear it in a bun or anything. No braids, nothing like that back in, in the 70s, in 78. So, um, you know, it, it kind of looked crazy all the time because, you know, you, you had to go take a swimming lesson and you know what happens with wet hair and swimming and then you have to go to class and so you dry, you couldn't go back to your room and fix it. And so it was always an issue. Some, you know, people were like, what's up, what's up with your hair? You know, because they're not used to ethnic hair. Um, so there are all these little things like that. Um, but not so much from the classmates, from the upper class, it was not so much a race thing back then. I mean, I know there, there, was, there were pockets of it, and back, back then you just dealt with it, you know, in society, but it was more the women thing. So the class of 79, which were the last all male class, were really looking at um, how they could run all, some of them, how they could run all the women out before they graduated, because they just were not for it. Now, when you talk about the, CAD, the, the leadership and the professors, um, that one thing that the academy did, uh, because it was a law that said you will have women, all the service academies um, will be open to women, as, you know, Naval, Naval Academy, West Point, Air Force Academy, and Merchant Marine. I think, you know, VMI and the other public school were private schools, not, not yet. So they were very committed to those that, you know, they, and some of the senior leaders that were not, didn't agree with it, they were asked to find another job, or they were not asked to, they were told to find another job because they were committed to the success. So there was a commitment at the top from the superintendent, the dean, you know, the commandant all the way down. And the same with the professors. And if they found that folks just wouldn't, you know, you know, weren't, weren't, weren't for it, then they, they said, hey, you can either get on board or you can leave because this is gonna work. So I think that was helpful that the, the cadres or the professors. So I, me personally, I, I know if I've heard of stories of others that ran into some folks that may have secretly, you know, did something or said something or felt something and reflected in people's grades or participation grades or things. But thankfully, I've never experienced that during my time there. Yeah, and so you, you never had any experience of anybody trying to run you out or saying that you couldn't yeah. really survive at West Point. Oh, I did have people that tried to run me out. There was a I won't say his name because I don't want to make him, you know, because I'm sure you know that he was young and. And then that, you know, during that time, we're all young, you know, early 19, 19, 20, 21 year old. But he, um, he basically told me that uh, when he graduated, he was a senior, I would not be there. Really? And, oh you know, yeah, and that was actually, I think, and that's one of the things where I'm actually grateful for that because I was thinking about leaving. I was like, I, I can't believe, you know, this was, it was really hard. It was hard, you know, just the, just the cadet life was hard. Um, you know, women, you know, still, like I said, some of the upper classes didn't, didn't, you know, um, want us there, but he, he, it was personal. And then when he said that, I said, okay, you, you, if you had said nothing at all, I probably would have quit after the first semester. But now that you, now that you told me that I'm going to stay if it kills me. <laughs> and so, so yeah, there were a couple that were, were you know, would, would say stuff like that. And, um, uh, yeah. And so there were some that, that, you know, would, would uh, have those comments or, you know, write you up for things that, you know, it was subjective, so you really couldn't argue about it, right? Your room's not clean. What, is, what do you mean by not clean? Um, I found a speck of dust, okay. So you, there, there were things that you couldn't really argue. Um, you just had to deal with it. And, um, but it gave me a sense of purpose uh, to prove him wrong. And I certainly did in more ways than one. So, so I, I took that negativity and kind of turned it around and, and used that to motivate me uh, for, uh, you, know, to, you know, to keep going and to, um, to finally succeed. Yeah, no, I can, I can understand that when you pitchforks. I've been in, I was not at a West Point or in a military 
situation. But when you pitch folks, you're 17 and 18 and you're in a predominantly white environment and you're being challenged, it sort of gives you the sort of inner resources and the inner strength to really cope and to, to try and achieve your, your goals. Which brings me to your other main, uh, uh, one of the main achievements, your decision to um, become a physician because you're a trained physician. Um, when did you realize you wanted to become a medical doctor? Well, it was during my time at West Point. And so, I, um, so, so I'll go back a little farther. So I'm a Trekkie from way back. And so I used to watch Star Trek when I was, you know, five, six years old, not the, not the reruns, but the original run, you know, <laughs> so can't believe it. But it really inspired me when I saw Lieutenant Uhura, who was an African-American communications officer, who was an officer on the bridge. She was a lieutenant, which is a equivalent of a captain in the army. And that was unheard of. That was the first time it broke every kind of record. Mr. Spock was a science officer. I thought he was really cool. So I liked science and I, I liked people and helping people. So I figured, you know, you know, medical medicine was a field and sciences that would allow me to um, kind of reach both of those goals. And so that's kind of what, uh, what drove me to, um, to pursue a, 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 a career in medical. But I got to tell you, Abby, it was, it was not an easy, easy thing for, for me because I was getting in my own way a lot of the time because there were others that said, you know, it's hard. You can't do that. And I would listen to them until, you know, you have your parents who say you can do anything, but you always say, well, your parents, they have to be encouraging, right? Because they love you. And of course, they're going to tell you you can do anything. But um, so finally, my, my mom was like, why do you listen to people? You know, your peers are telling you this. There are people in your class that are saying, well, it's, it's hard. You probably won't be able to do it. And they've not even done it themselves. And so, you know, you have to, you have to not let the detractors or the naysayers keep you from, you know, achieving your goals. And so that was one where, that was another lesson I learned is that I had to, um, you know, to, to kind of keep the naysayers at bay. Because there's always those that are out there that think, well, you know, you probably got to West Point because you're a minority. And so you probably aren't really that qualified. Uh, they don't know anything about you, but it's the assumption that some people can make. And, um, you know, sometimes you take that on yourself when you hear it all around you all the time, which is kind of, you know, what you were talking about at the beginning, you know, that's kind of one of the things of systemic racism is that, you know, you start to sometimes as the, the person that's been discriminated against to kind of taken on that, well, maybe they are right. If so many people are saying it, maybe they are right. And, and that's, I think, a really damaging, um, you know, part of that. But, yeah, it's a very sort of damaging thing to actually take these things in mentally right. and to um, internalize them. And this point you've just raised, which is a very, uh, I think, critical point, which um, all minorities face, the, the assumption whether it's at West Point or at other universities, which are not military universities, the assumption that um, what minorities achieve, um, they achieve not because of their intelligence, their abilities or their character, but their achievements are as a result of their race or, or their gender. And how did you cope with this? Um, and how did you deal with this at West Point? And did you have instances of this in your career when you were being promoted and moving up, moving up the ranks where this is being assumed or people are saying openly, you got where you are because of your race or your gender. Yeah, and that's one where, um, you, you know, at, at every level, you, you have those detractors that will say that. And it's kind of like almost a, um, you know, it's, it's a charged way of just deflating you completely when you're, you're trying to have a discussion or you're trying to say something or you're, you're happy about, you know, achieving something. And then all it takes is one person to say, well, you know, you just got there because of, of, of what you look like or who you are. And, you know, and, and you, and you want to just scream, but look at my record, look at what I've, you know, I've worked hard to get here. And it's, and, it, and they can just dismiss your whole, you know, um, your whole list of credentials uh, in just one word. And the people who say it sometimes, 
maybe not are not even as accomplished as you are. Not that anyone's better than anyone else, but you know, you've you've done things that they've not, and yet still they can they can claim, okay, you got it, and I didn't because of what you look like. And so, uh, it, and it did happen to me. It was it was one where um, when I got promoted to major in a in a um, it's called below the zone. So in the military, you are promoted. You're considered for promotion in blocks. So if you were you know, if you were a captain that was promoted in this year and this year, then you're considered. Uh, sometimes they'll actually look what's called below the zone, and one year before you're actually ready, if you've done things that are just really outstanding, then sometimes you get promoted early. And so to major, I was promoted early, and uh, I remember my um, and I call I call him a friend because he still is a friend to this day. Uh, that he said, well. You know, you know, not it's just because you're a, a black female. That's two quotas. That's two blocks. And I was just like, you know, and so finally, I just asked him. I said, look, you know, wh why do you say that? I said, here's, I said, here's my record. Take a look at it, because you know, back in the day before everything was on, you know, digital, we used to have binders with all of our, our certificates and all of our, you know, officer evaluation reports, which are OERs, we call it, we get on things and. And I said, okay, just look at my officer record brief. And it, that, your record brief has all the things you've done. So I graduated from West Point. If you just take my name and my picture off, a West Point graduate, GW Medical School. I've been to Airborne School. Air, you know, I hadn't gone to Air Assault then, but Airborne School. I was a distinguished honor graduate of my flight surgeon course. You know, I had all these things. I had a combat medical badge, which no one in my year group had because very few of us went to Desert Shield, Desert Storm. And so I said, if you just looked at this record, show me anyone, male, female, black or white, that is, has this and the good write-ups from my, from my superior officers. And he actually apologized. I said, hey, not, I, I apologize. I, I never thought about that. And, uh, and I said, you know, I won't say his name. I goes, you know, you know me, we share an office. And he goes, yeah, you're usually the first one in and the last one to leave. And, you're, you know, so he's like, but he, and he knew it, but he just, you know, he d it just wouldn't allow himself to, to think that. It just kind of came out. And he mentioned, he says, hey, where I grew up, my parents use the N-word all the time. I mean, so that's how I grew up, that, you know, lazy, they don't, you know, they always, you know, want something given to them for nothing and, you know, won't get up and work for themselves and all. And so that's kind of what he heard growing up. But the way I handle it, so you ask how to handle it, I could have said, hey, that's a racist remark, that's a, that's a sexist remark, and that would have just shut down the conversation. But I was willing to engage and he was willing to engage and listen, and actually, it, you know, changed his his mind. And so it kind of, you know, so I, I think the lesson there is we we can't get defensive, even though it's annoying. And it, why should we have to be? And I hear a lot of a, a lot of my black friends said, why do why do I have to inform? Why? And every time I turn around, it's like, well, you need to inform. Why? It's the information's out there. And I said, well, yeah, you can look at it that way because um, it is frustrating because we've been trying to inform for 400 years, but keep going, just keep, just keep informing. And so, uh, and we're friends to this day and he knows that he, sometimes he'd come up with something we, we were talking, you know, my husband and I and uh, him, this was many years ago about um, set asides for minority uh, business, small businesses. And he goes, well, you know, the quality is not good. He goes, I said, Where, what's your basis for that? Because it's something, it just, it just pops out sometimes. I'm like, dude, the things that come out of your mouth sometimes, do you think about what you said? What is the basis of it? And, he's, and he, he can't answer it. And then, it, you know, so he knows he's going to get, you know, scuffed up a bit, but he's willing to say it. I know there were people who were thinking that, that wouldn't say it to me. They would say it amongst themselves. Yeah, she, you know, she got promoted because she's black female. What do you expect, you know? But he was actually had the you know courage to say it to me, and um, I think we need to have those dialogues and be willing to put our defensive down just a minute because that would have been easy for me to flare up and say you know um, but just kind of put your defenses down and try to have a conversation uh, if if a person is willing. I think that's a great example of what we can do on an individual basis when we're faced with what is clearly ignorance and prejudice. Is there something else, other things, say, that institutions can do to help to educate people who have those views about minorities and their lack of capacity and, and their lack of talents 
uh, which could uh, help to educate people more broadly? I do. I think there are, there are quite a few things. Um, I, there's been a lot of documentaries. Thankfully, this, this horrific, um, you know, I, I, you know, Abby, I've not even watched the whole video of George Floyd's murder because I couldn't. But the fact that that was actually captured where others could see it, because if I had told you that, you would have not believed me, right? You would have thought I was exaggerating. You would say, okay, yeah. He I would have believed you because I have right. experienced right. similar yeah. things. Yeah. Well, well, one, you know, the, the, the public will sometimes say, well, that doesn't happen. Come on. You're, you know, you're exaggerating, okay? Eight minutes, okay, it was probably like 30 seconds. So you're going to say eight minutes just because it sounds more dramatic. You know, there may be people out there because no one would believe that that could actually happen to another human being. If, like you said, if it's not someone who's experienced things like that. The traffic stops. No one would believe it, and so I think educating people now with the with the photo phones and the and the video phones, there are so many things out there now that I think people have to believe it. And I think the documentaries. I think we may have talked about one. You know, the thirteenth, the the Netflix documentary about came out a couple of years ago about mass incarceration. Because another question: Why are so many black men in jail? Well, you know, go back and look at some of the things that were set up to. Uh, make it easier to put black people in jail. And there are a lot of black men in jail that have never done anything, right? And that's, everyone in jail says, I never did anything, but they're actually finding that people are arrested and are, you know, and, hey, you want to get out of here? Just go ahead and plea out. Plead guilty and, you know, you'll only get this much time or, you know, now are there criminals? Of course, there are criminals of all kinds. But I think when you see that documentary to say, this was something that was done systematically starting right after the emancipation proclamation occurred that put a, a whole group of people at a disadvantage for life. You know, being able to, you know, get money to start a business, even if you have the credit rating, right? To be able to get a job after you've gone to a school, a, you know, pick, put two resumes together of two individuals that graduated from an Ivy League school from the same, um, you know, background as far as the uh, academic, you know, uh, field of study, same GPA, you know, someone that has a quote black sounding name or happens to be a black person will get callbacks for jobs half as many times as their white counterpart from the exact same school. These are things that happen. And so it's not because people are lazy or they're not trying. Um, you know, you, you can't generalize, but in ge but, you know, because there may be some that are, of course, but for the majority, people are out there trying their best. Uh, and it's just one where there's just been entrenched, um, you, know, you know, not only beliefs, but teaching. And even the younger kids are taught by their families and uh, the opportunities just aren't there. You talked about the, the younger kids and, uh, and traffic stops. I know you have a son, um, well, you have a son and a daughter. And well, he's no longer a younger kid, but uh, he's also been stopped like practically all um, black males I know. Do you want to talk about that and, and what happened? Because he's following in your footsteps as well. I can. Can you hear me okay, Abby? I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you okay. Okay. Um, the, uh, yeah, and so my son, who, who was, a, was a West Point cadet at the time, senior year over Christmas break, uh, was driving too fast, so he was speeding, uh, but he ended up getting arrested, not just a ticket, and he's had no prior, you know, anything, no arrests, nothing. Um, and it was, it was actually coming from getting a haircut to go back to school uh, over after Christmas break. And so it's one of those things where, you know, and I, you know, I won't go into the, to the full details of it, but just as a harrowing experience as a parent, where he, um, you know, that was kind of the culmination of him being stopped probably about six or seven times that I know of. In fact, my uh, daughter um, mentioned, Mom, it's more times, but he just doesn't want to tell you. Like, he was stopped because uh, someone wanted to know where he's, he was going. You know, where are you going in Washington, D.C.? Right? He was, um, sorry about that, if you can hear the noise in the background. <laughs> Uh, there, you know, where, where, he was, uh, where he was driving to. He wasn't speeding. He didn't miss a stop sign. He was in a neighborhood in D.C. outside of Fort McNair, which is where I lived at the time on the military base. And literally, I mean, they would 
lean in the car, you know, as if to see if they could smell something or see something. Um, you know, again, ask him where he was going. And he's like, well, I'm, I'm going to see my parents at, at Fort McNair. And they would actually follow him to make sure that he, that he was going there because I guess there was, you know, the area right outside was, you know, had some, you know, maybe criminal activity, but he was just trying to come home. And literally they would sit and wait because, you know, if he just said that to lie to them and, um, you know, the gate guard would turn him around, they wouldn't have let him on post. So he said this police would sit there and wait. And then when he saw him go through the gate, then he drove on. Because I'm sure if he got turned around, he would have really <laughs> been in trouble if he just said, oh, I'm going there and, and then just pulls into the gate to um, get away from the police. But, you know, it's just all of this presumption of guilt. And, and even when he was arrested, he, he said, you know, the, the lawyer afterwards said, well, you know, you didn't have to get out of the car. And he, they searched his car. And she said, well, you know, you didn't have to let him search your car. And he says, what am I supposed to do? When he says, get out of the car, am I supposed to say no to the policeman who has a gun? Even if it is my right, I'm, you know, I'm afraid to do that. And I didn't have anything in the car. And, and he said, what do you have in there? And he said, you're, you're welcome to look. So clearly he, he waived his right, but he's, he wanted to make sure, hey, maybe if he looks and sees that I, I don't have anything there, then he'll let me go. Um, but then he made a comment, well, you might have a warrant up for your arrest in another state. And he said, sir, I'm a cadet at West Point. I, I can't have warrants out or I wouldn't be there. And he goes, here's my ID card. And he goes, well, we'll see about that. And, um, you know, for speeding. And it was, and again, wasn't under the influence, didn't have anything in the car, didn't, you know, wasn't, you know, reckless. He was just going too fast, which again, it's wrong, but yikes, it could have ended very badly for him. And, uh, you know, when you tell people about that, when I tell them about the seven times, uh, it was, you, you know, it's, uh, again, they're incredulous. They're like, surely it hadn't been seven times. I mean, he got pulled over once because they thought that he had his high beams on. And he was trying to tell them, no, no, officer, this isn't, you know, th these are just the regular. And he goes, in fact, when you pull me over, I haven't, you know, touched anything and you can look at my dashboard and it doesn't, you know, the high beam signal's not on. And he says, well, you probably just changed it when I drove up. And he's like, <laughs> and so it's kind of scary because you don't know if you're going to get a, a message that, uh, you know, hey, mom, come get me. But the one when he was arrested and sat, I sat in the precinct for literally it was about six hours while they processed him. And they mentioned, okay, yeah, because they have to they have to check every single state to see if they're if he's wanted. And I'm like, <laughs> so. You know, um, Nadia, how 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 did this make you feel as a mother, and as a general? Because this is your son, but you're in Fort McNair, as a general. How did you make you feel? Well, it wasn't the military police that were um, yeah. that were on post because they knew who he was he had the id this was the police outside the gate um you know as a mother it just scared me to death because you hear about you know what if what if he had um you know uh they became they were scared of him or something and if you saw my son i mean he's tall he's six three but he's like 185 pounds he's like a skinny guy he's not scary looking but you know they don't care they don't know they just um, see a, a black male and then they think, okay, this is a guy that might be doing something um, that might, you know, lead to trouble. And, uh, and as a mom, it just makes me feel like I just, it just scares me to death. Because literally, so about two months ago, he um, was on his way from Fort Sill, Oklahoma, uh, out to his, his assignment in Washington State. And he actually uh, was pulled over uh, on his drive over there. And uh, I told him, I said, make sure when you get pulled over, put your military ID on top of your driver's license and registration. So at least if they see that you're a soldier, they might, um, you know, take some slack on you. And sure enough, you know, when he got pulled over uh, and the question was, okay, I see Maryland tags, you're far away from home, where are you going? You know, I didn't realize that you had to, announce where you're going when you're driving across country. But, you know, um, so he told him and he saw his license plate, he saw his military ID. And that's the only thing I think that, you know, saved him is that, okay, the guy said, oh, okay, Fort, you know, you're in the army, you know, you're coming from Fort Sill. Oh yeah, I was, I was stationed there once before. 
And then they had a bond there with the military service, and then he, he let him go. But um, I'd like to, to come back to um, your military experience, because you've been a trailblazer in so many ways. And we've just had the 30th anniversary of Operation Desert Storm, Desert Shield, and you were deployed uh, out there. Um, what was that experience like? Well, that was probably one of the best experiences I ever had um, because, uh, you know, from the standpoint of being accepted for my skills and just also just being in the military, I'm, I'm, I really, uh, you know, enjoyed, um, you know, being in the field, you know, being in those operational units with soldiers because that's when you're, in, I love my job in the hospital as well, but when you're out actually out there in the field to take care of soldiers who may get injured or, or, or wounded, you know, that's kind of what I was, um, you know, what I was trained, trained for. And so when I showed up to Desert Shield, Desert Storm, uh, it was, there was controversy because, you know, women were not um, allowed to serve at the battalion level, meaning, you know, kind of at the, close to the front lines because of the combat exclusion rule. Um, but the, uh, uh, you know, when they, had to, when they had to send medical personnel down to the battalions from the brigade, which, which I was stationed at the higher level, um, there was controversy, okay, we've got a female doctor, we can't let her go, or the female medics. And there was a leader who took the, to, took the uh, initiative and said, look, we don't have time to go back and requisition other medics. There are no male medics or female medics. You get these or none at all. And so two of the battalions were like, okay, I guess, but the battalion I was with the battalion commander asked one question. He goes, can you fix broke soldiers? And I said, yes, sir, I can. And he goes, we're glad to have you. It wasn't, where did you go to school? Are you qualified? You know, he assumed he, I had instant credibility as a, you know, as a captain at the time, as a medical corps officer, as a physician, he didn't say, you know, you know what kind of, what, what kind of grades did you get? Where'd you go? He just said, hey, you're, you're a doctor in the army. I trust that you know what you're doing and you know what to do in a pinch if our soldiers, if my soldiers get injured. And that was really a, I think that experience kept me in the military longer than, you know, uh, or that the, that was early on in my career. So that put the foundation of uh, keeping me actually longer, I think, um, than I would have stayed uh, if I felt like it wasn't a welcoming organization. That's very interesting because it connects with something you said earlier on about West Point, that the leadership at West Point may, had a significant impact in creating the kind of supportive environment, generally supportive, which you had at West Point. And here the decision of a battalion commander in the field, recognizing first and foremost that you're a qualified physician who, can, who could actually fix broken soldiers underlines this importance of leadership. From your experience, and you a leader yourself, what do you think are the effective qualities of leadership and what does it take to bring about um, greater diversity and, and inclusion and the importance of leadership in this area? Yeah, Abby, I think it's very important. You know, leadership, uh, leaders set the tone of their organization. If, if you see any, um, I think failures of units, and I don't mean, you know, when they tried hard and they just didn't reach the objective, but moral or ethical failures in a unit when something goes really wrong, um, you know, on a, on a larger scale, you got to look at the, you have to look at the leadership. Now you might have like, again, one or two soldiers that make mistakes or do bad things. But if you have a culture in your, in your organization where rules don't matter, um, well, we can kind of bend things here. <clears throat> we'll just look the other way. If you have a culture like that, um, that's, that spells trouble. And usually it means that the leadership is tolerating that because you, you can't not know about it if it's happening at that level or if it's mirrored or if it's modeled by the leader. And so I think it's the same way with you know, diversity and inclusion. You have to have leaders that are willing to take bold action. When they see something that's not right, they have, they'll say it. Um, I, I gave the example of when I was with the, with the first armor division, you know, fast forward, I was a lieutenant colonel and I, there was a, the division commander there who, um, uh, we, we had a, a public affairs officer who, 
uh, they were doing a, a model or a prototype of a magazine for First Armored Division called Old Ironsides. And so uh, we were at the staff meeting, so it was the entire staff, headquarters staff, the PAO who happened to be black said, sir, here's the new one and he passed it to everyone. So as, a, as our, our commander, you know, two-star general flipped through it, he looked at it and I, we all thought it was great. And so he goes, what's wrong with this? And the, and the PAO was mortified because he was like, oh my gosh, is there a typo in there? Did I mislabel something? You know, what's wrong? Is it, oh my, is it backwards? I mean, he was thinking all these things and he looked at me and he says, it's too white. And we all, this was in 1990, okay? So that's 20 years ago that we weren't talking. And he's white himself. So, and the PAO is black, the public affairs officer. And he said, it's too white. And he goes, look, look at this. He goes, iron soldiers need to see themselves. And he could tell you how many African-Americans, how many Hispanic, well, it was called Hispanic back then or Latinx, how many um, Asians, how many women, he knew what his organization was comprised of. And that was before, think, think again, I mean, that's 1990 and 20 years ago, that really wasn't a focus. It always has been important, but not the focus. And for him to say that, um, and he said, you know, go back and, and give me some more. And he knew that he, and we don't have to put actors, we don't have to find black actors to put on a uniform and pretend they're soldiers. We actually had them doing their jobs that, that, they, could have, that they could have used. And so, and the thing that it taught me is I looked at the magazine and I didn't see a problem with it. It was great, right? Because it had tanks doing firing missions. And you see the big tanks with the, with the fire coming out at the end. And it was Noah. We liked it. It was like, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you saw guys in the motor pool. You saw the, you know, you saw the field artillery guys with the cannons and stuff. And so all these great pictures. We were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when I went back and looked, it was, it was all white males. There were very, I don't think there were any women in there, or any minorities. And it wasn't intentional. Right, it wasn't intentional because these were all First Armored Division soldiers too, and um, and it taught me. It's like, wow, I as a as an African American woman, I I didn't see a problem with it because I, I guess you're just so used to not being part of it. It just you just take it for what it's what it is, but it takes a leader to say soldiers need to see themselves. All of our soldiers, I'm responsible for all our iron soldiers. Go back and do it. I did give me another one, and the next ones were you know, people doing it. Signal Corps, you know, a lot of African-Americans guys, you know, putting wire down. That's the old days when they put wire down, right? In the, in the signal. <laughs> you know, they had them doing all these things that are important for the success of the mission. And that's what he, you know, it was General Casey was his name. That's what he knew. He said, people, people are committed to the organization if they feel they're a part of it. And I tell you what, I felt that's another a job that really made me feel like I was part of the team. I was an iron soldier. My, my name was Iron Doc because you know, everything with First Armored Division was iron this, iron majors, iron this. So I was Iron Doc. So that was my nickname. I loved it. So they even gave me a nickname. I was part of the team. And, you know, uh, and that's what it takes for a leader to do. You have to, so if, no, if he hadn't said anything, no one would have thought anything of it, right? The magazine would have gone out. Hey, look at this is great. Glossy photos, perfect. Look at them doing all these, you know, guns blazing. Oh, wow. But he knew as a leader, you have to look deeper and you have to make the effort to say, what, you know, is this the best that we can do to represent all of our folks? Because we need all the folks to show up and be part of the team and feel like they're part of the team. You'll give 110%, you'll give 150% if you know that you are cared about as a person and who you are, that you're valued, not that you're just there because they have to fill a hole, right? So that's where I think leadership is. And that was an example to me. And I actually made, you know, I would always say, you know, all my medical stuff, hey, we need to get, and it wasn't just race diversity, like in, in the Army Medical Department, we had veterinarians, very small number, um, but they take care of military working dogs and they also do food safety. They have a lot of preventive health type of missions in the military. So when we all just had doctors and nurses and you know that's all who of. But what about the dentists, right? What about the administrators? What about the radiology techs? What about the pharmacists? What about the medevac pilots that were also part of our team? What about our veterinarians? And they used to call me up and say, man, we saw you, we saw the picture. And I made them put, make sure you know it's a veterinarian. So they usually were doing like examining a military working dog on the pictures that we would put out. And so they always loved it because they're like, Man, you always you know have your vets in there. You always make sure you don't forget us. And they're very again very small branch, but they're important to our team. 
And we used to have this collage and I would look to see and I would make sure we had a reservist. We had to make sure that they could see the patch, that it was a reserve or National Guard because we are multi-component. It wasn't just active duty. And, you know, I would wear them out because they're like, man, we're, you know, <laughs> we have to have, but people need to see themselves and leaders need to make the effort. You can't just grab something and put it out there. You have to be thoughtful of what this represents if it's representing your organization. I'll stop Abby because I'll keep going. Yeah, well, no, this is fascinating. You say um, on that point that people need to see themselves and they need to see themselves at all levels in an organization. Uh, the army has been on the forefront and, and done better than many other sectors of American life in bringing about diversity of the force. But the leadership of the army is not as diverse as the force itself. So given what you've said about the importance of leadership and the need for people to see themselves reflected, particularly in the leadership, um, what can the army do to um, have better representation in a more diverse leadership? Um, well, first, why is this the case that the leadership is not as diverse as the force itself? And what can the army do to bring about a greater diversity of its leadership? You know, um, Abby, it's, it's a constant effort. Um, and, and one of the, the hopes that I have with, uh, you know, what's happening now with a awakening of society on the racial injustice, I hope it doesn't become like one of those 90 day news cycles where things start to peter out. And I, I, I'm hopeful that it's not because I think it's got the momentum. And I think that's, that's an example where the army, I think you can never take your foot off the gas because and they won't even admit, they may have taken their foot off the gas um, because we, we, we used to have, I mean, there were at one time three African-American four-star generals. You had, you had General Vi, General Brooks, and General Austin yeah. all four, that were all, you know, um, all, you know, uh, four stars. We had multiple three stars. But then as people retired, I mean, there are, you know, I retired, Gwen Bingham retired, who's the other, um, she was the second African-American three-star female. Now there are no African-American three-star females. There's one two-star um, because, you know, once we retire, you can't, you can't, you can't um, uh, say success, mission complete because it's a constant, constant thing. We have one African-American four-star now, General Garrett. And if he retires, you know, yes, there's some now that they're bringing up through the ranks, but um, the army is looking at it. They, they realize, hey, we, we haven't been as um, consistent in ensuring these, taking these bold actions to making sure, and again, it's not putting someone up there who doesn't belong there. It's making sure that you have those opportunities and not like General Casey. They'll say, okay, yeah, we'll pick this, 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 and this guy. And if there are 30 people being considered for three jobs, you know, it's not a percentage. Okay, well, that's only, you know, 10%. So, you know, we don't need to have one black person if there's only two, you know what I'm saying? We only have three blacks out of the 30, you know, just by sheer, sheer you know, uh, you know um, chance, there's a chance that none of them will be selected. But if everyone's qualified, everyone, and at that level, when you're, when you're picking people for two and three star general, they usually, it's, it's very a thin line of, who's better than who and, and this and that and the other. So sometimes you have to be deliberate in making sure, because if that happens every time, there's only three, you know, and only um, one gets picked. Okay, three out of 30, that's not even 10%. But every if you do that every time, right, we will never have people that are gonna be um, looking like the folks that they, they come from. So you have to be deliberate. And it's not giving something that they don't deserve, it's being more deliberate when you're choosing people um, for positions. Like when I was selected, uh, there were, you know, literally um, for Surgeon General by law, there's a law that says, okay, all colonels with this many years are eligible to be considered and actually just being promoted to one star, you know, there's a date. There were a thousand colonels that were eligible to be selected to be a one star general in the Army Medical Department when I was picked. So how do you, okay, there's a thousand. Okay, let's say 500 of them didn't have all the, you know, senior service college. When you say, okay, there's maybe 300 
that are going to be able to be picked for one position. You know, it's a wash. Who do you pick? Sometimes you have to be strategic in saying, we need to have people representing other groups. So let's pick this person this time. You know, just as good as any other, why not, the, you know, why not me? And that, that, that's the question I used to ask. Well, gosh, why me? And one of my mentors said, well, why not you? Um, and, and hopefully I did a fairly decent job. I think anyone could have done a decent job, but in those, in that group of folks, but sometimes you have to pick people so you can further the, the greater goals of your organization. And I think that's what, uh, you know, that's what the army. So, so now the army, there's been several, uh, and in fact, I was on one of the panels where the our AUSA, the Ar Association of the U.S. Army, talked to the senior leaders, some retired general officers, talked to, you know, some senior enlisted spouses. So they actually are really seeing how can we, how can we do this? Uh, how can we make sure that we don't drop the ball again? And it starts at the captain level, because again, if they don't have those experiences like I had, where I felt like I was part of the team, they're talented young, you know, men and women, they can go other places. So why stay in an organization if you don't feel that you're valued or that you don't feel that you have, you know, a chance to be at the top. So they're actually looking at that. What can we do better to ensure that we've got the right mix in, you know, combat arms, because most of the general officers come out of combat arms, infantry armor. A lot of the African Americans, uh, you know, younger soldiers go into combat service support. And so they may not have as, you know, robust because they don't go in those because they may not see themselves having a, you know, long-term um, future. It, it's, it, again, it, it goes back to the, it starts early um, because you have to have the individuals in the pipeline in order to get uh, the end state that you want. We're in the midst of this COVID, really tragic COVID-19 pandemic, which has really upended all our lives and changed how we interact with, um, with one another. And the COVID-19 pandemic is having such a disproportionate effect on minority communities. As a physician, what sort of interventions do you think are needed at this point? And also, are there lessons that we can learn from the military experience which could usefully be uh, applied to the civilian response to COVID-19? Um, I, I think there's so uh, uh, quite a few things to say about that. So first, the military piece, or the, I'll, I'll start with the access to care piece. And I think the advantage that I've had and that my family has had is that as a soldier, not a black soldier, white soldier, female soldier, as a soldier, I have access to outstanding healthcare, phenomenal healthcare, having been the Surgeon General, I can tell you it's the greatest healthcare on the planet. But um, because I can go to the hospitals, just like the rest of the soldiers, you, there's a process that we are all part of. And so when you look at the ability for, if, it was, if I'm stationed at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, if I'm black or white, it doesn't matter what I am, I can go to the hospital there, the clinic there, um, or if they don't have it, uh, the, something on post, they send me downtown, I get seen by the, the local, uh, you know, local healthcare facility. You know, it's all under the, the TRICARE plan for our soldiers. So we benefited from, you know, kind of that's an example. It didn't matter where we were from, um, it just because of the fact that we're soldiers, we had access to this phenomenal healthcare system. So I think, you know, the lessons to be learned is to have, um, you know, better access because there are healthcare deserts in some of our communities. There, there are some, you know, um, and right here, in, I live in the DC area, right in the shadow of the Capitol building, there are areas where people don't have sufficient healthcare coverage, um, don't have sufficient you know, grocery stores so they can get healthy foods to stay healthy. I mean, there are so many things that impact health and so many disparities I think that the COVID is, crisis is uh, uncovering is the impact is because of lack of access and then more chronic diseases. Well, why do you have chronic diseases? Because how do they become chronic? Because you couldn't take care of them when they were acute. And so most African-Americans have a lot of hypertension, diabetes, because first they can't, you know, if you're in, a, in an underserved area and you don't have the means, you don't have the way to eat healthy uh, foods and you don't get, you know, don't have a, access to go to the hospital or a doctor to get your preventive care or your medications. 
So yes, you've got the chronic disease that puts you at risk for you know, um, infectious diseases and things that, are, that come along. So I think what we can learn is that we need to find a better way to have you know, better access to care for uh, individuals um, in all communities. Um, and, that's, and I think that's one where uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll see in the future as we're trying to come out of the other side of this. Again, that's an institutional racism. And even those who can get care. I mean, I, I shared with, the, with, with some team a study that they did about you know, African-Americans getting less pain medication for the same you know, illness or injury as their white counterparts, because there's just a perception on the healthcare providers that they're either over, and, and they did actually like a long bone fracture. So if you break your femur, your, your bone, you can't hide that, right? The x-ray can show bone broken. <laughs> you know? Like a headache, you can say I have a headache, and it's like, well, how do you characterize headache if there's nothing that they can see or back pain? Yeah. If someone comes in for a fracture, if you're, if you're black, you get less pain medicine than a white person has the same type of injury. Kids, acute appendicitis, that's another thing. Black kids get less pain relief than white, the white counterparts, just because there's this perception. And if you interview, they interviewed some of the students, they thought that, well, black people have a higher tolerance to pain. What? what? <laughs> you know? So that we have, a, and again, it goes back to your initial comment, Abby, about the systemic, you know, just the long-term ideas. And this isn't professionals. These are in scientific, you know, science-oriented professions that have these thoughts or their drug seeking behavior because they learn, oh, they're only here because they want drugs. And they're only here because they, you know, it's terrible. We have to, there are so many ways and so many areas we have to address um, to get after people wanting to get health care. Um, and then the last thing is, is this, there's a suspicion amongst the black community. If you remember the, the you know, the Tuskegee experiments, Yeah. you know, yeah. Uh, when people say, why do I want to go there? And there, of course, why do you think people are suspicious if people say, get this vaccine? Here, let me give you this shot. You know, it'll make you feel better. Well, what is it? You know, are you experimenting on me? Um, so there's this trust issue. Um, there's this misperception issue on, you know, uh, doctors and students about patients. And it's just really sad. There's so many things that we have to unpack and, and address to get after this, and, and hopefully this is a time that we'll, we have a dialogue that can, um, that, can, that can address these things one by one, because it's not one fix, right? And the dialogue we've been having now um, in the country and around the world about race has largely be prompt, has been prompted by the Black Lives Matter movement. And we've seen the Black Lives Matter movement explode around the world. What has been the impact on you personally? I think for me, it's been, um, it gives me hope. And it gives me, um, you know, that, and, and, I, and I'm just crossing my fingers that this doesn't become a, you know, like 90 days and then, okay, now we're going to, you know, um, move on to the next thing, you know. I hope it's sustained and we work on it. So that's what, that's what it's gotten to, you know, for, for me, I've seen it. Uh, and it's not just in the U.S. Like you said, it's all over the world. When you see people from predominantly white countries with Black Lives Matter t-shirts on, uh, it really gives you hope. And I, I don't think it's just, uh, and, and people can be cynical, right? People can be, say, oh, they're just doing that because it's something cool that they want to be a part of. Well, maybe it is, but I like to think that people are saying, hey, we really need to look at this. Hey, this is really not good. Um, and we need to really address it. And I think it, it's kind of like one of those things you want to say, Finally, people are seeing that this is something that we have to um, we have to address, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that people, if they take the opportunity to learn, you know, the fact that there there's an acknowledgement is really uh, you know heartening because before it's kind of like it's all in your head, or it's kind of like why don't you people just get over it? You know, you hear that slavery was 400 years ago. I didn't have anything to do with it. Just get over it. Well, we'd like to. We really would if there were things that were, you know, if we had the same opportunities, if we could rent, you know, buy bribe property in, in areas that aren't redlined, if we could get accepted to jobs just like our white counterparts with the same credentials, if we could do all these different things that a lot of people are afforded, uh, if we can address the mass incarceration issue, um, I, I think that would be, you know, we, we, we would be able to get over it. So hopefully I think this is a time to, that we can actually start getting after it. 
We're talking about um, so slow development to bring um, minorities into mainstream and into positions, and at the same time talking about hope. Um, Vice President Joe Biden has selected Senator Kamala Harris as his running mate, and she is the first African American woman, the first Asian American woman to be on a presidential ticket. As a person yourself, a leader who's broken barriers, um, how do you feel and what do you think this says about America and its future? Um, I think it's, uh, it, it's very positive. I, I was uh, so excited to see, um, similar to when uh, President Obama was, uh, was elected, whether, what, whatever your politics are, whether you're Democrat or Republican, um, just the fact that you, know, you can think of in this country, a black person can be the president of the United States and get reelected. And so that was, it's the same thing with, um, with, uh, with Senator Harris, well, Vice President nominee um, Harris now. She's, uh, I think, an inspiration to all of us because, again, she's competent, you know, she's tough, uh, and which is needed. And I say that in a, in a positive way because, as a, you know, they always say as a prosecutor, you have to be tough and you have to have thick skin. And I'm glad because I know they're going to come after her from all, all sectors they already have. You can hear just the you know, the ugly, you know, things that are being said. And, you know, I just hope she can stay tough and just keep going because, uh, you know, she is an inspiration to a lot of people, uh, myself included. So that's, uh, um, I, I wish her well. Well, we, we have um, many students who are joining us um, uh, and tuning into this conversation uh, in addition of course, to alumni and friends of, of Tufts and Fletcher. Um, do you have any sort of message that you would give to them uh, at this point? I would. I would say, you know, the young, young people are our future. I mean, that's who's going to be around, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, uh, running the world. And it's, uh, you know, it's up to our, our, um, our, our youth to kind of get us out of this as well as our um, the people that are, are running things now. And uh, what can you do? And a lot of people say, what can I do? What can one person do? Well, a one person can do a lot. You can have a conversation. Uh, you can look at yourselves and say, okay, where, you know, where am I on this issue? How do I feel about this? And then what can I literally do um, to uh, make things better, especially when we talk about social justice, racial injustice, what can I do or things that I can learn? Um, don't be defensive on either side uh, because you can be and you have you can maybe say I have the right to be but then we will never get anywhere um, if I say I'm not a racist uh, that doesn't help and, and I'm not saying that people are racist but a lot of times you know people are like well I can't say I'm not a racist because then it's you know that's uh, that I get attacked if I say I am a racist and people say I knew it all the time. So there's a lot of people that are just uncomfortable. They don't know what to say. I think on all sides, we have to drop our defenses and be willing to have the conversation. Don't be, don't, you know, be, be slow to be offended if people are really coming from a place of saying, okay, how do I, you know, I don't know if it's right to call you, not, like even now, is it black, is it African-American? Is it Hispanic, is it Latinx? If I say the wrong thing, Someone made a comment, said Oriental once, and someone jumped on him and said, it's not, we don't use that word anymore. It's like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean any, you know, we have to be willing to say, okay, if people are coming from a place where they're trying to learn and trying to get better, let's give them, you know, let's, let's help them out here to see if we can get them into the, to the right place. And so I would, I would just say to the young folks, okay, you know, having the dialogues, learning as much as you can and, and make a difference and make a statement. If you see something in the military, we always have this, if you see something, say something. That's what we tell our soldiers when we're, you know, if you see something, say something. Uh, don't be afraid because it's going to be, you know, you're, you're inheriting the world that, uh, that you're going to be living in for good or bad. So, um, so keep, you know, study hard, stay safe, wear your masks if you're outside, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> well, Nadia West, thank you so much uh, for being on Global Perspectives. It's a pleasure to have you and thank you very much indeed. Well, thanks so much for having me. It was, a, it was great talking to you. It really was.
Take care now. Take care.